to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Welcome to our study of answering denominational doctrines. In this series of lessons, we are examining the doctrines of prominent denominations against the Word of God to see if they line up. Today we're going to be looking at Catholic doctrine. Is the Catholic Church, the church you read about in the New Testament, do they have the right to give and to take away salvation? Is the papacy and is worship of Mary and things of that nature, is that what God wants in the New Testament? Can you take the New Testament and the end result be the Catholic Church? Absolutely not. The New Testament is, does not produce the Catholic Church. A departure from the New Testament created the Catholic Church. That is, you don't take your New Testament and read it and end up with the Catholic Church. Those who departed from reading and departed from the commands of God created the Catholic Church. And so, can we see in the New Testament the seeds for apostasy that led to Catholicism? Absolutely. Here are three very clear seeds of apostasy from which the roots of Catholicism come. For example, the first seed is this. Catholicism teaches the placing of the teaching of men, both oral and written tradition, above or equal to the commandments of God. Were the seeds of that found in the New Testament? Absolutely they were. Notice Matthew chapter 15 verses 7 through 9. Jesus teaches us in this text that we can't put commandments of men or oral tradition above God's commands. Jesus says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why? Notice verse 9. In vain they worship me, notice this, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Now we're going to notice it a little bit later, but Catholicism exalts oral tradition, exalts the writings and edicts of the popes and the Word of God, and they pretty much put all of them on a level plane. And so here you've got some of the initial seeds. The Pharisees were following commandments of men, tradition of men, not God, and as a result, Jesus condemned them as hypocrites. Catholicism does the same today. A second seed, the forbidding of people to marry and eating of, eating of certain foods, forbidding to eat certain foods, was started in the first century. There were people then who were already saying, no, you can't marry, and no, you can't eat these foods, just as Catholicism teaches celibacy and not eating certain foods on certain days. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 following. The Scripture says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Notice the doctrine, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Watch this, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. The Catholic Church clearly teaches that the supposed priest cannot marry. Well, Where does the Bible say that? Well, it doesn't. The Bible says nothing about that. And yet, where does it come from? A departure from the faith. Well, about the eating of certain foods or not eating of certain foods? No, the Bible doesn't say that either. Every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. How did those doctrines come about? They were the seeds of error that were already being taught in the New Testament, which led to a departure from the faith known as Catholicism. A third seed found in 3 John 9 through 11 
John wrote to the church there, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, would not receive them. What was the seed there? Here you see the initial seeds of the papacy beginning. One head elder, one man who wants the power and the authority. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, around 100 to 150 A.D., he made the first distinction between the bishops and the elders. But here you've already got Diotrephes wanting that power, wanting that, that preeminence, which ultimately led to one man, the Pope, being head supposedly of God's church today. And so what do we initially learn about Catholic doctrine? It is not the product of the New Testament. It is a departure from the New Testament. Now as we think about Catholicism, another error of it is their faulty view of Scripture. Concerning Scripture, Catholic writer John O'Brien in the book The Faith of Millions, The Sunday Visitor, which is a kind of a guide for a lay Catholic, says this, From all of which it must be abundantly clear that the Bible alone, listen, is not a safe and competent guide because it is not now and has never been accessible to all because it is not clear and intelligible to all and because it does not contain all the truths of the Christian religion. Can you believe such a brazen statement as that? The Bible alone is not a safe and competent guide. Uh, the Bible is not now clear, accessible, intelligible, and it never has been. It doesn't contain all truth. Why don't you stop and think about this? Why would Catholicism want you to think the Bible is not all truth, it's not intelligible, it's not clear, and you don't have it all? Here's why. Because if people start reading the Bible for themselves, understand that they can know it and understand it, and start doing what it says, that would get rid of, eradicate Catholicism around the world. They don't want people to study it because the studying of God's Word does not align with practices of Catholicism. Now, be sure, the Bible says, here's the big problem. Catholicism said Bible is not our only guide. The Bible says it is. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Must I do everything by God's authority? Absolutely. Well, where do I find that? The Spirit expressly says that in a latter time some would depart from the faith, but also God, who at various times, various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Where? In the Word of God. Hebrews 1 verse 1. The Scripture teaches in John 17 verse 17 that God's Word is all truth. Catholicism clearly says it's not all truth. The Bible says it is. Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth, your word is true. Now someone says, well, we don't have it all. Mm, wrong again. John 16, verse 13, Jesus said, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Did the Spirit come? Absolutely. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. From that point on, they began to reveal all truth. And here's what's interesting. Close of the New Testament. The Bible says we now have all truth. We are to contend earnestly for the faith, listen, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The Bible is our only authority. The Bible is what we follow. We do have it all today and here's what's interesting. The Bible says you can read it and understand it. I want you to notice Ephesians 3 verse 4. Very simple statement but I want you to see these words. Notice this. The scripture says by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, let's combine that idea with 2 Peter 1, 3. As God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. What do these two verses side by side tell us? When you read it, you can understand it, and it is everything you need to get to heaven and be right with God. And so the Bible is our only God. I don't need the edicts of church fathers. I don't need the, 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 the ideas of the popes. I don't need the commandments of them. I need the Word of God alone and it can save me. Listen carefully. Any religious group that tells you this book isn't enough isn't from God. 
because God says the exact opposite. Another doctrine of Catholicism that we want to answer is that they say the Catholic Church. Catholicism teaches the Catholic Church is also a source for authority. Again, in his book, The Faith of Millions, O'Brien illustrates this point when he says, the simple fact is that the Bible, like all dead letters, calls for a living interpreter. Just as the Supreme Court is the authorized living interpreter of the Constitution, so the Catholic Church is the living, authoritative interpreter of the Bible. Now here's what I want to ask you first. Where does Scripture say the Catholic Church is the living, authoritative interpreter of the Bible? You can read from Genesis to Revelation and you'll never find that. What's the, why, why would somebody say that? Because if I read passages like, Matthew 23, 9, where Jesus clearly said in the sense of religious leaders, call no man father. And I say, now wait a minute. My Bible says call no man father, and the Catholic Church calls their priest father. How do I combine those two ideas? Well, you need to go to the priest, and you need to let father so-and-so tell you why what you're reading doesn't line up with, with Catholic doctrine, and since we are the authoritative interpreter, you need to listen to us. It is a very deceptive and very damning idea to say, very condemning idea to say, you can't understand the Bible. We've got to tell you what it says. Again, that smacks in the face of what Scripture says. Ephesians 5.17 says, Do not be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I have a personal obligation to understand God's will. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus didn't say, These things are hard. You probably can't understand it. The Catholic Church is your authoritative interpreter. They'll make you free. No, Jesus said the truth will make you free. And remember, I want us to see Ephesians 3 verse 4 again. Do not buy into the idea that you can't read and understand your Bible. Look at it again. Ephesians 3 verse 4 says this, By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul clearly taught, God clearly taught, a man could read and understand the things that Christ has brought to us. And so the Catholic Church is not the living authoritative interpreter. The Bible is its own best interpreter. We need to ask, what do the Scriptures say? Jeremiah 37, 17. We need to ask, is there any word from the Lord? Romans 4, verse 3. And when we search the Scriptures daily, as Acts 17, 11 says, we can know God's will. Another error of Catholicism is that the Pope has authority on all religious matters. Here's what Catholics believe. When the Pope, in his official capacity, proclaims a doctrine of faith or morals binding on the whole church, he is preserved from error. When he says something about morals or doctrine, he's preserved from error? Again, where does the Bible teach that? Number one, where is the authority for having a Pope to begin with? You read in Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 20, and there were a plurality of elders in every city. The only time you see a man trying to act like the Pope, 2nd or 3rd John 9, God condemned it. And so there's no authority for a papacy. There's no authority to call any man father, Matthew 23, 9, and no man is perfect. Romans 3, 23, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The main answer to this doctrine is the Bible's absolute silence on the subject. Where, here's what I ask you today. If we, as we've already seen, the Bible is our only guide and it has all truth, where does the Bible say the Pope is free from error, that there is a Pope first of all, and that he is free from error when he speaks on doctrines or morals? Well, you say, I've read my Bible and it doesn't say that. That's exactly the point. God tells us that we're not perfect, but his will is perfect and we must follow that. Another doctrine of Catholicism that is not in accord with the Scripture is the idea of penance. Let me explain to you what that is from their own writing. Catholics believe that the church has power to forgive all sins. This forgiveness of sins is a, a true sacrament or idea instituted by Christ. It's different from baptism, per particularly on its account of judicial form. That is, they can make decisions. Sins are forgiven only 
by the sacrament of penance, sins are forgiven by absolution, a total forgiveness, which can only be given by an authorized priest. It is a real judicial pardon. Now listen, the church has the power to reserve certain cases. Friend, listen carefully this morning or today. God is the only one who forgives sins. You never see in the Bible where anyone has the power to forgive sin, ultimately forgive sin, outside of God. Yes, I may sin against others, and as I do what the Bible says in line with the will of God, they're bound to forgive me also, but God is the one, when I sin, God's the one who forgives that. And nowhere in the Scripture do you see anything about the church having the power to reserve, listen to that, reserve certain cases. What's that mean? Even if I'm penitent, even if I do the right thing, I still may not be forgiven. You see, the idea of penance came about uh, in history when there was a need to gather money. You may remember the old saying, as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory flings. That's often been an idea of how it was associated with money. The more you can give, the more penance you can get. Oh, you can get penance, but it's going to cost you. It was often about greed and about raising money and about using emotionalism and things of that nature to cause people to do what they do. And so understand, it's God who forgives sins, not the Catholic Church. Acts 2 verse 38, Jesus said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He, who God, is faithful and just to, or is faithful to give us all our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. God is the source of the forgiveness of sins and nowhere again do you read about Catholic doctrine of penance in Scripture. It originated with man, it was often based on greed, and it smacks in the face of true repentance and the forgiveness of who God is, or the forgiveness of God. Now another doctrine that I want us to think about regarding Catholicism is that they would teach that the biblical mode of baptism is sprinkling or that sprinkling is an acceptable mode. If you want to be baptized in the Catholic Church, likely as a child, your child would have a little water sprinkled on his head. Is that what the Bible says? Is sprinkling a biblical mode? Absolutely not. Sprinkling, sprinkling is not a biblical mode of, of, of correctly being baptized. Someone being immersed is the biblical mode. Now, let me illustrate that. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Jesus here is going to be baptized. He comes to John to be baptized, and the Bible says, And coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Now, here's the question. To come up out of water, what must you first do? Go down into water. How was Jesus baptized? What mode did he use? It's clear Jesus was immersed. Acts chapter 8 verse 36 following. Here's Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. He's already made the confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They both, they stop the chariot. They both get down out of it. They go down into the water. He baptizes him and they come up out of the water. Another clear picture of someone being immersed. Think about the way John the Immerser did it. John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in Aenon near Salim. Why? Because there was much water there. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. How much water does it take to sprinkle? It doesn't take much. How much water does it take to, to pour on someone's head? Again, not much water. A cup or two would take care of that, a few drops even. How much water does it take for full body immersion? Much water. Final illustration from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul is dealing with the idea of baptism. And he says there that baptism is a burial. Think about the last time you've been to a funeral. They take the body. They dig a hole in the ground. It's covered on the bottom. It's covered on every side. Then they place the body all the way in the ground, and they cover it completely. It is completely engulfed in the ground. That's the, the illustration, the, the manner in which God chose to describe baptism is a burial. And someone says, well, what if children sin? Isaiah 7, 14 teaches us there's a time in which before you learn to choose the evil and re or to refuse the evil and choose the good. There's that age of accountability wherein we're innocent, 
We're created in the image of God and we've got to reach a point where we come to know what sin is. In fact, here's how you can know for sure that sprinkling of babies is not a biblical mode. Does the Bible teach, I've got to believe in Jesus? Absolutely. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you will surely die in your sins. And so a baby's got to believe. How many babies have that mental faculty to believe? Jesus said you have to. Uh, the Bible teaches you've got to make the good confession. Romans 10 verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How many babies can say the words that the Ethiopian eunuch said in Acts 8 verse 37 following? Well, they can't. They can't speak yet. Uh, and on and on you could go. They can't repent. All those things. And so they're not candidates nor are they in need of obeying the gospel because they're in a safe state until they reach that age of accountability. Now another doctrine from Catholicism that we want to examine according to the scripture is the doctrine of exalting such people as Mary or Peter or quote Mother Teresa and others when the Bible says we should not worship people. We want to exalt Mary. I want to exalt Peter. I want to have these statues and Mother Teresa, oh, she was such a godly person, people say. Should we make statues of those people? Should we exalt them? Should we pray to them? What does the Bible say about that? Jesus made it clear. Matthew 4, verse 10, You shall serve the Lord your God only. You shall worship Him only. Revelation 19, verse 10, John is in, in such a state of awe by the message he's heard of victory that he falls down at the feet of the angel of worship. The angel says, do not do that. Worship God. And so we don't worship anyone except God. We don't worship angels. And think about Acts 10, verse 26. Peter, a prominent Jewish man who's been converted to Christianity, is taking the gospel to Cornelius in his house, a Gentile. Cornelius is in so thankful for him coming that he falls down before him to worship. And what did Peter say? Peter didn't say, kiss my ring, see my funny hat. That's not what he said. Peter said, stand up. I myself am also a man. Now, the papacy is supposedly the lineage of Peter. Peter did not accept worship. Peter didn't have people fall down in front of him and kiss his ring and things of that nature. Such is not found in the scripture. And so we cannot worship other people. We cannot worship angels. We need to only worship God. Matthew 4 and verse 10. And then we have the idea as well of the Catholic hierarchy of, of clergy and laity, which is not at all found in the scripture. Where does it say that you've got this clergy laity system and by that we mean you've got a, a pope papacy you've got an archdiocese an archbishop you've got a, a bishop you've got a, a father where does all that where do you find that in the bible and where is there a big you and little me in the bible there there is none of that in fact here's one of the clearest ideas from scripture about the errors of Catholicism. Catholics are taught to call the priest father. Father so and so, I ask you to forgive my sins today. Uh, that's the way they think. Is that biblical? Absolutely not. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 9. Jesus said, call no man father. Now in the sense of giving men titles, looking up to them as religious leaders, what did Jesus say? Here's a clear distinction. Catholic Church says we call our priest father. What did Jesus say? Call no man father. Here's what it comes down to today, friend. Are you going to do what the Catholic Church says or are you going to do what Jesus says? The two are diametrically opposed to each other. You can't say I'm following Jesus and be a part of the Catholic Church. It is not the church you read about in the New Testament. Philippians 1 verse 1, you've got the saints, the deacons, and the bishops who are in Philippi. Elders are the spiritual overseers, the leaders. They're the shepherds, Acts 20, verse 28. Deacons are special servants appointed by God, found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And all men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. I need the blood of Jesus Christ as, next, as, as much as the next person does. There's no big me and little you. We all are equal in God's sight. Romans 12 verses 3 and 4 tells us we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Even elders shouldn't do that. 1 Peter 5, they don't lead as dictators or lords, but as helping those who are in need 
of God's mercy and God's grace. And so when we look at the Bible, what do we see? Catholicism does not line up with the Word of God. Let me be as plain and as clear as we know how to be. You cannot follow Catholic doctrine and get to heaven. And someone says, well, you're judging me. No, I'm not. John 7, 24, Jesus said we're to judge with a righteous judgment. We're not judging you. God has already said what the truth is. God has already made the judgment and He has said, don't exalt the tradition of men. Call no man father. He's clearly taught the Bible as our own authority. We've got to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. We're not to worship other people. If God has clearly taught these things, and these things are in diametrical opposition to, they're diametrically opposed to the teaching of Catholicism, how can one say, I'm a member of the Catholic Church. I belong to the church you read about in the New Testament. No, such is not the case. It is not a product of. It is a departure from the faith. Now, the good news is this. You can become a member of the New Testament church. You can become a part of the church of Christ. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the one you read about in the Bible, and you can become a member of that today. Are you a part of of that one church, Ephesians 4 verse 4. How do you become a part of the church? Well, let's think about it. What did they do in the New Testament to become Christians and Christians only? The Bible says you first have to hear the Word of God. Much of this lesson has been about our need to listen to God as the final authority. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I've got to hear what God says in Him alone. Then I must believe in Jesus. It was Jesus who said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John 8, 24. Having believed, you must be willing to repent. Jesus said, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I've got to make the good confession. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And I've got to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, don't get caught up. In Catholicism, it's popular. A lot of people buy into it, but it is not what you read about in the New Testament. If you've been a part of it, we're begging you, come out of that today, become a New Testament Christian. Won't you obey the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is brought to you by loving, caring members of the Church of Christ. The McLeish Avenue Church of Christ in Ardmore, Oklahoma, oversees this evangelistic effort. For a free CD or DVD of today's broadcast, please write to The Gospel of Christ, 607 McLeish Avenue, Ardmore, Oklahoma, 73401. That's The Gospel of Christ, 607 McLeish Avenue, Ardmore, Oklahoma, 73401. You may call 580-223-3289. Please visit us on the web at thegospelofchrist.com. We encourage you to attend the Church of Christ, where the Bible is loved and the gospel is preached. The gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.